Um, today we are continuing our study in First Peter chapter five. Um, I've got verses one through eight um, in my notes. We're going to concentrate on five through eight, but I want to just briefly read through that first section to remind us of where we are in our study. Um, today we are speaking on humility. If you think, I don't need to hear about humility because I am the humblest guy I know, or gal. We all need to hear about humility. We are all prone to drift. We are all prone to think of self. Uh, And the thing about humility is not to, and I, I think I've covered this before, is not to think of yourself as so low um, and like dirt and I am so terrible and I, I, I. That's still thinking about yourself. That's a different kind of pride, thinking of yourself. Or, um, well, humility is actually thinking less often of yourself, thinking of others before yourself, thinking, the Bible says, higher of others than you do yourself. That's hard to do, man. I, I mean, I'll just admit it. It's, um, you know, especially when like, you're driving down the road and you're the perfect driver, Right? And just people don't obey traffic laws. Like there's signal lights on your car for a purpose, people. Come on. Right? (laughs) Put the phone down. All right? Anyway, but that's, that's not being humble. We count to 10. Serenity now, right? Let's uh, review with me um, from verse 1, and then we'll get into what we're studying today. So I exhort you, the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, I have to slow down with the CH and the SH there, just for your information, you know, um, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunities that we have um, living here in this country like we do that, um, God, we can do this, that we can stand and proclaim your name. We have the freedom to do that. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you we have that privilege. Help us to be diligent and not waste that privilege, God, that we can claim your name all around us, that we all can see ourselves as missionaries for the gospel, for your name. We are your ambassadors here, God. Help us to be mindful 
and intentional about telling people about our great king. We love you, Lord. Be with us this morning as we read your word. Give us discernment. Give us wisdom and understanding. And then the courage to apply what we see today. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Humility is not like a fan favorite subject, right? We can talk about all kinds of other things, you know, like prosperity and healing and different things like that. But humility doesn't rank very high, right? But it ranks really high here in the word and we get a constant reminder to be humble to think less often of ourselves to think of others first to love one another i mean this is this this echoes throughout the bible right it doesn't matter what author has written what book it is throughout the bible why do you think that is Because it's important. Yeah? Because, like the song says, we are prone to wander. We're prone to drift. Verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject. And um, what Peter is not necessarily talk now there is respect young you know, age differences young people should be respectful of older folks and stuff but what peter is talking about here is the maturity in the faith if you're a new christian pay attention to those that have some years those that have been around for a while and have experience in their walk with the lord Humble yourself. Listen carefully. Pay attention. Observe. Be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves. That means you put this on because it's not in your nature. It's not, it doesn't come natural. You have to put it on. Clothe yourselves all of you with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. James also talks about this same quote, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And it's actually a proverb, Proverbs uh, 3, 34. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor or grace. The, the more stubborn that we are, the more we are set in our ways, and my way is the way it's going to get done. Maybe there's these echoes in our, in our heads sometimes when, when we are corrected and, and we think, how dare? Don't you know who I am? I like listening to Frank Sinatra, but that song, right? You know what I'm talking about? I did it my way. It's a good song. Like, I like how he sings it, and he's powerful and terribly off. I wish I had the lyrics in front of me. I've read them recently, and... And uh, talk about someone that's lost. But, in case you don't know it, that is in the church also. Wow. 
we have a tendency to want recognition. It feels good to be recognized. It feels good to have people talk about you in a, in a good way. It, it appeals to the, to the self. It really feeds that part of us that honestly should not be fed. The Bible talks about if we get recognition here, then we won't with him. You've received what you wanted. Whenever we see Jesus giving people a hard time, guess who he's given a hard time to? It's to the religious people. And they would go to the wall and pray and give these fancy, poetic, majestic prayers. And they didn't go any further than the top of their heads. Jesus is talking about that very situation to his disciples. And he's saying, and he's got the Pharisee on one side and a tax collector on the other. And the Pharisee is thanking God for everything, all the good things in his life and how great he's got it. And thank you, Lord, for this and that. And thank you for not making me like this tax collector. What does a tax collector pray? He says, Lord, forgive me. I am sinful. I am broken. I am nothing without you. Who was receiving God's grace then? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we, when we apply that to our life and we think about... Th- Listen, this isn't just throwing rocks, right? This isn't just straighten up. Peter is writing this letter as an appeal. This, this is the last that, that we hear from Peter. He knows what's coming. And as a good pastor, he's telling all of these churches that he wrote to and to all of us, Guys, you got to get it together. I, this may be the last minute on earth that I have, and I just want you to get this straight in your life. Because I care about you. Because I care about your eternity. Humble yourselves. Love others. Think of others. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you. So that we, when we go face to face with the Lord, and he, and we're dealing, right, our accounts with him and what happened on earth and what did you do that he may say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And we can't come to the Lord arrogantly demanding God, I need this right now. Or we can't come negotiating. If you do this for me, then I'll do whatever for you. The heart of man is arrogant. Think. Those thoughts that you don't share with anybody else, that stuff that's down in here, in the depths. You will agree with me. The heart of man is arrogant and self-centered. And we're constantly pushed toward humility. 
Humble yourselves. Allow God in due time to reward you. But we constantly want our way. I do most of the driving. And sometimes I just don't feel like driving, so I let Bethany drive. But um, this isn't a shot at her, this is at me. I'm like pumping the brakes. Oh, we're going there. You should go this other route, like my route, to get to where we're going. I know that's just me. Just me. We want things done our way in the way that we do them. And if they're not done that way, then it's just not right. And the AC should always be at 69, especially down here in Texas, right? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This is, this is a hard one to embrace because we worry, right? We are concerned with stuff in the future. What's going to happen? And, uh, right, we've been talking about the refining fire. We go through this fire. Why? So that we may be purified, so that we mature, so that we grow up. And part of that is suffering. There's a kind of suffering here in, in, in First Peter. And most of the suffering that we talk about is, okay, we have ailments, we have sickness, we have all of these things, right? The suffering, the very specific suffering that Peter is talking about is suffering for Christ. And so when we have anxiety about suffering for Christ, it directly applies to our walk and how much we're going to trust him. When we look at, um, throughout the Bible, the men... Jonah especially, it comes to mind when, they see, when he says, only this far. I'm not going to go talk to those people. Do you know who those people are? Whoa. Our anxieties about our suffering for Christ. Peter is saying, cast them at his feet. Because he cares for you. He loves you. And it doesn't matter what you go through, suffering-wise, for my name. I'm keeping an eye on you. I know your situation. That's what the Lord is telling us. Like, don't worry. I got you. Here, here is the delicate part, and I'll try to be careful with this. Humility is casting our anxieties, right? The opposite of that, pride, arrogance, is not surrendering our anxieties, right? We want to hang on to certain things in our life. We don't want to let loose. 
And it's a, it's a constant thing in our life where we need to be retweaked, we need to be adjusted. Sometimes I'm going to be the wrench. Just letting you know. In Hosea, I'm going to go through a few scriptures. Um, and they're reflecting on our issue with pride or humility, however you want to see it. We're too prideful, not humble enough. However, but this is where we're going. Hosea 13, verses 4 through 8. There's this self-satisfying thing like... Let's read. But I am the Lord your God. From the land of Egypt you know no God but me. And besides me there is no Savior. It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled and their heart was lifted up. Therefore they forgot me. So I am to them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk beside the, the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breasts, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. That's very graphic. Very graphic. But that is the issue that the Lord has with prideful people that are self-sufficient and self-satisfied and only think of self. What's in it for me? Deuteronomy. Verse 8, 11 through 20. We're going to do quite a bit of reading, so hang in there. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules, his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses, sorry, my glasses are failing me, and live in them. And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the houses of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery, serp- fiery serpents and cor- scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might be he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. We're gonna stop there. There's more. Self sufficiency. I don't need anything from anybody. Jeremiah 13, verses 8 through 10. Refusing instruction. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. Sometimes these other gods, they don't really, they don't have to be statues or official, like Greek gods or, or um, Middle Eastern God. It doesn't have to be like a named God. Things in our life can be gods. Anything that distracts us from the one and only true God becomes our idol. Sometimes it's good things. Things that aren't necessarily harmful. 
Sometimes it can be a basketball game. Sorry, we're in Texas. Football. You know? You know what I mean? They're good things. I love my family, and that's my first ministry. But if I lift them up above my Lord and Savior, they become my idol. Ah, that doesn't feel so good, man. I'm, if I had a seat, I'd be shifting in it right now. It doesn't sit well, right? Psalm 119, verse 21. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. We don't like to see that side of God. Very much a part of God. In Daniel, I won't read the whole thing, but in Daniel chapter 4, there's a story of Nebuchadnezzar and how satisfied he was with his kingdom. And on one occasion, he walks out and he's just checking out everything, the landscape, and he thinks to himself, look what I've built. I, I, I have a tendency to hear it in my, in my head like this. Look at what I've built. Let me read just a little bit. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, It's not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal resident and for the glory of my majesty, while the words were still in his mouth, he hadn't even finished saying. There fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. He's driven out into the wilderness, living like an animal. In Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 through 24, 21 through 24. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of God and not of man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Pride. Anything within us or external that gets in the way of giving all our devotion, all our glory, all our attention to God is an idol. In Proverbs 28, this is our last one. Proverbs 28, 25 through 26. Greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in, a wis in wisdom will be delivered. Walking in wisdom humbly 
fully dependent on the Lord. In verse 8, back to, back to 1 Peter. This is our last verse. Be sober-minded. All of this, like, it comes full circle. Peter is giving us instructions to be humble, giving us our, our, our place. Why? Because the end of all things is coming. Be sober-minded. It means have eternity in your view. This is not all there is. This contributes to where you will spend eternity. It matters. It's important. So invest your time well. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Why? Because while we're here, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. For those that are saved and, and God is, is keeping and, and will make it to the end, sometimes the enemy can still have an effect in your life as to how effective you are to reach the lost. You may be secure, but he definitely gets in the way of how effective you are for the gospel. And for those that are not, those that are not saved, well, he's got you already. We don't like talking about the devil and hell and that kind of stuff. It just, uh, but it's, it's for real. That is the outcome. If you don't abide with the word, that is the outcome. He wants to devour you. All right, Pastor, well, that's it. Let's go celebrate. Oh, this should cut through, man. This, the Bible is a two-edged sword. And wherever we're failing, wherever we're messing it up, like, whack, it should cut right through there and penetrate and make a difference in our life. If we need to think on it for a minute, think on it for a minute. If we need to grieve over our own sin, Take the time to grieve over it. If it's just a wake-up call, man, listen to it. I'm convicted. Just reading through it, studying, like, whoo, man. Lord, forgive me. We have an opportunity today to square up our accounts with each other, with the Lord. There is grace. Grace for the humble. Grace for the humble. But he opposes the proud. Don't be proud. We have an opportunity this morning to listen to the Holy Spirit guiding us and abide. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to your word, God, to um, humble ourselves before you and receive instruction. Give us the courage to apply this to our life, God so that we may grow into the people that you would have us be, so that we can impact this world for you, for your kingdom, or that we can lift your name. We love you, God. We thank you. Do a work in our life.